the entrance exams to God's university. The book of James has been compared to the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament. Both of them emphasize the practical aspect. The learning experience for the child of God is the emphasis in both of these books. The book of Proverbs is not just a series of proverbs that are strung together like beads on a string. Rather, there is a story that is told. There is, first of all, the appeal to the young man as he begins life to enroll in the school of wisdom, God's school. And we find that the young man matriculates in the school. And actually, we have the ringing of the bell and the classes begin. And you see the development of the course as it goes through the book of Proverbs. James enrolls the child of God in the university of God. There are entrance exams to be taken, and these entrance exams are not easy. The fact of the matter is they are very difficult. It's a hard hurdle to clear. The lessons, first of all, are contrary to the thinking of the natural man. The natural man, the unsaved man with his natural mind, he could never qualify for this exam. This is a book written to believers, and you must be a believer to take these exams. As they enter the university of God, and by the way, that university has another name. It's sometimes called the University of Hard Knocks. It's God's university. And in it, he says, rejoice. That is the key in many ways, the overtone and the undertone of this book that we have here. Now, because most of you that are believers here, you are a candidate for a degree in God's university. And somebody says, well, what field will I get my degree in? Well, there's only one field. The major that you have in the university of God is faith. God teaches his own faith. Save by faith. We grow by faith. We live by faith. And we die by faith. The child of God enters, the moment that he trusts Christ, he enters a life of faith. And that is the great theme God wants to teach us in his university. Consider it wholly joyful, my brethren, when you are enveloped or encounter trials of any sort and fall into various temptations. Be assured and understand that the trial and the proving of your faith bring out endurance and steadfastness and patience. The testing or the trial of your faith is the Christian to experience joy in depth in all the trials troubles and tensions of this life? The answer that I would give, if I may be permitted to give an answer, is no. Trouble is not given to us for trouble's sake. Trouble is never an end in and of itself. God just doesn't test us just to be testing us. There is always a reason for it. Now he says, count it all joy. And that's the internal attitude of the heart, that the joy is the result of the trial, not the trial in and of itself. This idea today that there's something joyful in the trials and tragedies of life, that's not true. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous but grievous. It's exactly what it is. It's a tragedy. It's trouble. There are trials. 
their problem, our calamity, our suffering, our disappointment, our heartbreak, then the internal attitude of faith is that God has permitted this for a purpose. And it's a high and lofty goal that God has in view and he intends to work this out in our lives for that which will be good. I'm of the opinion we will not understand. This is the test of faith. We walk by faith and not by sight, and this is one of the tests of faith. Some of the purposes that are served in the testing of faith. As God put down for us today certain guidelines that give us an inclination at least, an idea of why he permits trouble to come, why he tests his saints today, why he puts them into the fires of suffering. Well, I'm going to mention three. The first one is this. The testing of faith is proof positive of a genuine faith. When your faith is tested, then you'll know whether it's genuine or not. You notice how he began this? Knowing this, that the testing of your faith, the two participles, knowing and testing, he does it that you might know. Let me illustrate. He was in Marseille in France, and the Gestapo arrested him there because he was a Jew. That was in 1944. He was put in the Drusi concentration camp. There were 105 thousand Jews in that camp. There were only 1,400 survivors. He was one of them. After the war, he went back into Alsace. He began a business. In fact, the matter is, he invented something that would have made him an immensely wealthy man. But because of the circumstance at that time, why, he lost everything. And he became very much discouraged. He emigrated to Canada, where his sister, another sister, had gone. And when he got there, he met reverse after reverse, disappointment after disappointment, and he planned suicide. In fact, he set the date, April the 9th, 1961. May I say to you that he took one last chance. He went to see a preacher. Baptist preacher in Canada. He said, do you have anything to say to a man that'll be dead in 24 hours? And he did. He ridiculed this man. The preacher said, let me pray for him. And he ridiculed him for him. He says, you can pray. And while he prayed, he ridiculed him and blasphemed. But he said, when I left, some of the scriptures he gave me struck my heart just like a sower. I didn't commit suicide in 24 hours. I went back in 24 hours, and I came to know Christ as my Savior. And now I know, he says, you why ask you God you touch my put me through the fire. Right now, God. My friend, my fellow medical workers, that God. man today yes. will not argue with you about uh, the inspiration of the scripture or the hypostatical union of the virgin birth. He knows his faith has been tested. Are some of you, our Lord is speaking now, that believe not? For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. They couldn't stand the test, you see. And they went back. You remember our Lord turned to his own disciples, the 12, and he asked them the question, will you also go? And they did not go. However, Peter answering for them, you have the words of eternal life. They were genuine. Now again, let's look at this testing of faith that God gives. 
God called a little shepherd boy by the name of David. That little shepherd boy went through a great deal of testing. When David became an old man and he's sitting in the palace, I think he's right at the end of his career. It was before his death. As he sat in the palace, he thought back over his life and he remembered when he was a little shepherd boy out yonder on the hills of Bethlehem. Then he looked at his life. He saw how God had led him. And that's when he wrote Psalm 23. It is a man that has been tested who wrote, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He never wrote that as a theological professor who knows nothing about life. He never wrote that as some inexperienced man. He wrote that as a man who has had his faith tested in the fires of adversity. Paul the Apostle was another man that was really tested. Fact of the matter is, he was told when he was called that he was to be tested. The Lord Jesus said, I've called him for two reasons. One reason is he's to be my witness to the Gentiles. The second thing is I'm going to show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now, the reason for that is so that when Paul wrote, nobody since then could stand up and nobody here could honestly, truly stand up and say, well, it's all right for Paul to say rejoice, but if he had to live in Los Angeles where I do and go through what I go through, he couldn't say that. Well, I don't know what you're going through, but whatever you are going through is nothing compared to what he went through. His faith was tested, and when he wrote the epistle to the Galatians, he said this, From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. As a man that's been tested, here is a man that knows. And God, my friend, if your faith is genuine, will test you to prove that your faith is genuine. Why? Never been tested. Faith is not a trained elephant, nor is it lived out on a mental trapeze. It must walk the street. It must live in Los Angeles. It must do that in order to be real, my beloved. Therefore, faith must be tested, and God tests faith. Now, I say to you today, my beloved, this thing needs to be brought out of the ideal atmosphere and out of space, and brought down to the street where we live and move and have our being. God says, taste of the law and see if he's good. This thing has to be tested, and God wants it tested in our lives, permitting us to be tested in many, many different ways. There is a second reason and purpose in the testing of faith. It produces patience in the life. May I go back to these two verses? Be assured and understand that the trial and proving of your faith bring out endurance and steadfastness and patience. But let endurance and steadfastness and patience have full play and do a thorough work so that you may be people perfectly and fully developed with no defects, that is, lacking in nothing. I sat out there at that medical clinic waiting for an x-ray. Oh, I think I sat there for 45 minutes. Dr. Isaac, And I got up and I went over and I said to the girl, I says, what's the matter? He said to me, just be patient. <laughs> oh, my beloved, may I say to you, it's patience is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. God never gives patience to a person as a gift. He's trying to produce, if you please, he's trying to produce patience in your life and my life. Paul says in the fifth chapter of Romans, and not only so, but we joy in trouble also, 
knowing that trouble worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. A great many people say, oh, Lord, make me patient. And God sends them trouble. And they said, Lord, I didn't ask for trouble. I asked for patience. And he said, that's what I'm doing. So that we learn patience. And then patience produces hope. And then hope produces love and the love of God. And this is not our love for God, but God's love for us is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Happy is the man who is patient under trial and stands up under temptation. For when he has stood the test and been approved, he will receive the victor's crown of life, which God has promised to those who love. The man of the world today sinks beneath the waves of adversity. Even life at its best makes many people pessimistic. The unhappiest people in the world are your Hollywood crowd. There is right now an epidemic of suicides among teenagers. A commentator made the statement this week. He says, during the Depression, there were no suicides. Young people had no chance at all, but they had a will to live. But today, everything's given to them and they want to die. May I say to you, my beloved, there is today something about life for the natural man that produces a pessimism. No hope, no future. When faith is tested and you're surrounded by darkness and the waves roll high over your little bark and all seems lost, the child of God knows that this is not the end. He can say, if all were easy, if all were bright, where would the cross be? Where would the fight? He tells us that there is a crown of life for those who stand the tests of life.